Welcome back to the Win With Dice podcast, a podcast featuring members of the Win With Dice team. I'm Calvin, and I'm joined here by Ramon. Hey guys, is this your first time listening to the Win With Dice podcast? We talk about tabletop RPGs, running them and playing them. Calvin and I like to take a casual approach to the hobby, and uh, we just discuss like the games that we get to play in and the games that we run, and just to show you guys a little bit of behind the GM screen and you know talk about ideas and kind of just share our story. Yeah, we like to demystify the other side of the GM screen, so maybe you can take a shot at running a game for your friends. Uh, so this week, uh, we have fallen dreadfully behind on <laughs> recapping unintended consequences. So we're very excited to get back to that and to the cowboy dimension, because a whole lot has happened over there. And we also wanted to provide an update on some of the OGL stuff we talked about last week. Uh, but before we get into all that fun stuff, we have to get to the most important part of the show. The Win With Dice Weekly GM Tip of the Week. Yes, the Win With Dice Weekly GM Tip of the Week. Brought to you by Ramon. All right, cool. I'm here. Hey, thanks, guys. So long and short. Uh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> hey. Uh, we, we... <laughs> So the long and short of it, um, the the idea of of NPC bad dudes uh, in during your counter design is you know uh, it's better to have like one kind of tougher NPC uh, versus like you know uh, a lot of chaff. I mean you have to balance it obviously, but it's like you have to take in consideration more than just like maybe even the outline of like your rule set like i think in pathfinder they might have like a point like you can build an encounter or even just like the upper limits or lower limits of it i'm uh, really taking consideration like the number of enemies in the map their location and like approach com- like a, an encounter design from a 3d approach like think about like where your players are going to start where your enemies are going to start how much like you know and uh, if you have a really tough bad guy uh, and putting him into an advantage position and putting like a bunch of other dudes in front of him like that's that's gonna be a tough scenario than uh, you know probably intended like it, specifically uh, like in Pathfinder uh, I know that they there's like a level cap where it's like oh if you take a level monster that's like four higher higher uh, than your party level then like you're good to go but if you take that character put him in a very advantageous position and then give him basically free turns because the players have to like use their movement while they get to just attack uh that's like double dipping so if you have a really tough bad guy put him in like a in an average or kind of shitty position to start with and then you play and it kind of evens out you gotta take the terrain into consideration yeah, I think, like, because Pathfinder does do, it does have some tables you can use to do some math on, like, encounter difficulty and things like that. Uh, but obviously, it, it can't take into account your party, the map positioning, and the specific enemy abilities and things like that. It just takes, like, the level of the enemy. So, yeah, yeah. while it would say that something, a certain number of levels higher or lower is, like, outside of an effective range for you... Um, you know, obviously, it has to compensate for what the actual level is because you can still be challenged by something that's a very low level if it has some specific abilities. Like, there's a D&D monster. I think it's called, like, the Nilbog or something, and it's very weak and very easy to hurt, but it has an ability that makes it just very hard to hit without getting charmed. Yeah, yeah. And there's also, like, ghosts and stuff that just say, like, it's it's immune to like uh, mundane weaponry or something like that, right? right? Where it's like you need magic to de- de- defeat it. But if your party's just a bunch of bros <laughs> with swords, it's like you're gonna have a bad day. <laughs> yeah, right? like the calculations would be the same if it's the same level as something else, but like it's immune to crits or whatever. So yeah, yeah. And and uh, another point um, to for Pathfinder specifically uh, because the attack. Because the critical threshold for critical hits um, and critical failures are 10 up or 10 below or whatever, a failed roll or like a a successful attack, um, every time you go up a creature rating, I forget what it's called in Pathfinder, but if you go up a creature level, essentially, uh, that's another 5% chance of of a crit happening because it adds plus one to the roll. So all their rolls, everyone's level ties into their their attack roll. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if a creature is four levels higher, that's like 20% chance to crit. And then, <laughs> and then I'm not, this is a, a little bit of foreshadowing for what happened during t- this t- uh, um, unintended consequences, but that shit stacks up fast. And then, you know, you, you can start uh, spiraling out real quick. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely been in, in positions where that has happened. Uh, yeah. Calvin, as a, the PC murderer. It's only. 
five. I I forget how many died in that one shot we talked about a while ago, but it was three before that. <laughs> it's three before that. Ten over here. Eleven over there. It's okay. <laughs> it's that many. It's not that many. Uh, yeah, Once we there start you playing go, Starfinder again. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go, folks. There's your uh, Woman Dies tip of the week. Uh, yeah, just be careful about uh, your enemy and map design. Uh, take take everything in consideration. Take a 3D approach. Okay. All right, well, let's hop into the episode. So quickly up the top, I wanted to give a recap on what's happened with the OGL stuff since we last talked about it. Uh, again, we record these a few days before they go out, so some stuff might happen in between. But I kind of wanted to... Um, <clears throat> I want to get this off my plate uh, so I can stop staring at Twitter <laughs> when I'm trying to work and seeing what's going on. So I just want to get this Kyle out just, there. Kyle just presses the refresh button. Just like <laughs> Honestly, you're not wrong. <laughs> so I just want to check out from this personally. Uh, so what happened last time when we spoke about this was that Watsi was introducing a new OGL 1.1. Uh, now, the OGL, or the OGL 1.0a that people have been using since 2000, basically allows people to use uh, Dungeons & Dragons content to make their own tabletop RPG content, as well as using it to apply to virtual content or live streams and things like that. Technically, it shouldn't have applied to those things, and we can get into a whole discussion about that. Uh, there's a whole Legal Eagle video that does a way better discussion on it. Um, but essentially what was happening is that people were able to make content for Dungeons and Dragons, their own adventures and campaigns and settings and things like that. And they were published under OGL 1.0a. Uh, and then OGL 1.01 was coming along. A draft was sent out to people um, like that they could, you know, look at it and sign it, basically. Um, but it had some provisions that people were concerned about. Those being royalty payments on revenue over 750k, as well as having to report your financials if you own over if you uh, get over 50,000 in revenue. Um, Watsi being able to use your content irrevocably if you use their license, um, being able to you know change that contract as long as they give you a 30-day notice as opposed to previously, uh, where they were able to terminate if you breached the contract. Uh, several things like that that made people concerned that they might just, you know, take your content if you sign up with them or take your revenue if you make too much revenue. Uh, even on like a Kickstarter or something like that. Yeah. So what happened since then is a community backlash of extreme proportions. Uh, there were people from like content creators in the tabletop RPG space, uh, popular ones like Ginny D, XP to level three, uh, Crit Crab. One of my one of my uh, channels that I listen to, um, and as well as other like very popular YouTubers spoke on it, like Most Critical and Yong Yeah had a couple of videos on it as well. Um, so users of D and D Beyond were sort of encouraged to cancel their subscriptions, um, which caused sort of an overload on the site. Uh, it went down for a time, um, and some people said that they were unable to get to the unsubscribe button that like was supposed to be in a certain spot on the menu. Like I couldn't confirm that myself because I wasn't subscribed. I just went and deleted the account that I had. Um, I did download the one character that I made on TNT Beyond. So um, that one little halfling bard uh, is, is safe from deletion, but... <laughs> that one little man. That yeah. little man who didn't do nothing wrong to nobody. <laughs> didn't hurt anyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they're fine. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so some people were saying they couldn't find the unsubscribe controls. They had to use, like, an external link to get there. Um, and part of the motivation for this was an email received by YouTuber D&D Shorts, and I'll have a link to uh, that below, where they received an email from an employee at WotC, um, and they, like, D&D uh, &D Shorts confirmed this on their own, if you're, you can be skeptical about it as you, if you want as a source, because again, it's just like a screenshot of an email, but I would encourage people to check it out anyways. Um, but essentially what the email said was that the rollout of OGL 1.1 was being delayed due to the response, uh, largely because of the impact on Watsi's bottom line. Um, and the most obvious, or at least the quickest source they had for that information was the loss of D&D Beyond subscriptions, uh, which obviously makes a certain, a certain amount of money for them per month. They saw an extreme dip in that, so they are delaying their rollout of the OGL. Um, it also claimed uh, that management would rarely speak positively about the community. And in the words of the person who wrote this leaked email, uh, 
that management saw the community as obstacles between them and their money, which, um, I mean, that sounds about right from what we're getting. I, like, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I can't confirm that, but obviously the impact of the uh, subscriptions on D&D Beyond was something that did gain a response from WotC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that response was posted on Friday the 13th. It claimed that the uh, le leaked document, the leaked OGL 1.1 was a draft, uh, despite that not being the case until, according to what was received and who had received it. Um, and again, was meant to address like discriminatory, discriminatory content and NFTs and that sort of thing. Although realistically, they could have just added provisions in 1.0 to do that, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, they also said that the details and like the new information was meant to, it wasn't meant to impact the community, but it was meant to apply to large corporations. Although if they do mean that, I feel like 750 K is a very low bar to set for revenue. If you want to apply it to large corporations. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's like, because I think that the amount of, it's like, they want to catch new people as well right so it's not like not even like you can hit the already established uh corporations that's fine but you want to stop people coming into that kind of level right like we've seen an explosion so like in the last like 20 years i was doing like last like 10 years right mm. of companies right of, of tabletop rpg companies um you know and they, they want to slow that down. They want the space to be limited because they want to be the top still, right? right? The more people in the, yeah, the more competition that's in the market, the, the more likely someone can rise above them, actually. Exactly. and um, Or get close. But right? interesting, like, that market share. like I, um, I think it was Ryan Dancy, the first, one of the people behind the uh, actual creation of the OGL, or the person behind the creation of the OGL, um, had said, like, Having the OGL in place, allowing anybody to make content for D&D is better for D&D because that means they make something that they like, their players like it, all of them go by the player's handbook. And I mean, even if they don't buy it, they're still in the space, they're still talking about it. Like they're basically getting content for free uh, with the yeah. original OGL. Exactly. And like, I think that like it, it even makes them, they can literally produce less yeah and make more like you know and, and still profit off of it even more because like all you have to do is just dictate the price of the book <laughs> right yeah if, if if you increase the player's handbook by like 10 percent and put out a new edition everyone's gonna buy that edition because everyone's gonna make new content for that edition i would say that if like when d like because when fifth edition dropped i know that like pathfinder split off because you know four was a little bit of a, a tank for them mm -hmm. but i mean when fifth edition came out it's like the amount of fifth edition content was crazy right and it's like even people are updating old stuff that they made for 3.5 for fifth edition and like people right. are still buying it people still need the fifth edition rules like i don't know man i it's it's weird because i'm like a war i i well I, I was a part of the warhammer community for a little bit and it's like the amount of money people put out for rule books is crazy <laughs> we're talking about like 40 dollars a book basically like every if you had two armies that's like two books probably every like six to eight months um and every year essentially and that's just like rules yeah so you know and that's not on top of like models and stuff like that so it's like i don't know i think D, &D had like a they could have been a better marketing strategy going on but i think they just really wanted to control the space if all of this allegedly stuff is confirmed. I mean, they did you know. say they thought the audience was under monetized and that makes sense for what we're seeing here. Um, but anyway, so the changes they said they wanted to make to uh, the new OGL 2.0, or at least what they said they're going to be changing about the 1.1 draft is that content under 1.0a will be unaffected, like already released under 1.0 will be unaffected. Um, they want to make it more clear that it only applies to tabletop RPG content, not like live streams and cosplay and virtual tabletop stuff. Um, yes. I mean, yeah. Um, no, no loyalty payment structure would remain in place, uh, which is very good. Uh, no license back provision, uh, which is the thing that people saw as a way for them to steal work. The license owner would still own their work. Um, although the leaked draft did say that the license owner would continue to own their work, it's just that Watsi had the right to use it um, worldwide, irrevocably, all those lawyer words. Yeah, that's like basically saying that you don't own it anymore. <laughs> 
anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> we 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 all own it now. <laughs> we own it now. Our content. Uh, Our, however, yeah. uh, it would seem that the age of the OGL is over and the time of the orc has come. Because... <laughs> Rejoice, <laughs> gamers, rise up. <laughs> Uh, Paizo has announced that they are creating a system-neutral license. So I'll have a link to their announcement below. You can go there and check that out. Uh, they addressed how you know how long it took for WotC to make an actual response. Um, they did post this on the 12th, a day before WotC posted on D&D Beyond about the changes they were going to make. Um, they stated that OGL 1.0a should be irrevocable, and they were you know aware of that because they were there. Uh, like many of the people who are in Paizo still, like Paizo owner uh, Lisa Stevens and President Jim Butler, uh, they were in the D&D team at WotC at the time. Um, and they have other connections, like they have a whole bunch, I don't want to like, you know, rewrite their whole article, but yeah. a lot of people involved in Paizo were over at WotC. Uh, so they were aware of the intent of the OGL, and they're prepared to argue that in court, which is something that I was worried about, because I figured, you know, D&D has Hasbro money, but apparently Paizo is willing to go, you know, for that fight, so good for them. But they also said that they don't necessarily need the original OGL because of how far they've moved away from Wizards' expressions of game mechanics. Um, right. It was really only, they only included it in the Pathfinder 2E and Starfinder books as a way to allow other companies to use the, uh, the Paizo content as opposed to having their own license. Oh, I see. That makes sense. What? Uh, with all those potential changes, uh, and even if they go back on it, I mean, the fact that Wizards tried to do it, I feel like this makes sense to do. They are developing their own irrevocable, and they put irrevocable in italics, which is very nice, because apparently that wasn't included in 1.0a. Um, irrevocable Open RPG Creative License, otherwise known as the Orc License. <laughs> nice. I love it. So it is a system agnostic license. Um, it's going to be made under the guidance of Azora Law, which is an IP forum that represents Paizo and other publishers. Basically so that it's not under Paizo itself. It's not going to be owned by any company that makes money with tabletop RPG stuff. So mm -hmm. in case somebody changes at Paizo, the license itself won't change. Um, Paizo offered to pay for the legal work of transferring over there. Um, and then licensees can use that to make their own open rules reference documents. So everybody can have their own SRD for their own systems. Oh, that's perfect. Actually, I think so. Is that is that uh, going through, or is that just what Paizo's like statement was that they're going to do this, or is it as has there been motion on it? I don't know if you. There's been so there are some publishers signed up with it already. It is something that they're working on. Um, it's like there's some some of the stuff is still being printed at Paizo at least. So you're still gonna see you know 1.0a and a few printed books for I think at least halfway through this year. But it is yeah. something that's coming. I believe they want it this year. I don't know if it will be because they're still, you know, finalizing all that. They still have to work on the legal ramifications of that, at least. Mm -hmm. um, but it does involve Kobold Press, uh, Chaosium, Legendary Games, Rogue Genius Games, and of course the homies, Green Ronin, uh, who published fan who published the Age System, um, as well as Mutants and Masterminds. Yeah, nice. I mean, I think that you know. Again, I'm I'm very, I don't know. I feel pretty good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that pace is like, this is stupid. Uh, <laughs> forget you, Watsi. Like, because uh, I don't know. I, I think that uh, I, there's there's one thing to like have an IP, and then there's like, you know, another thing to like. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like it's kind of like how like Disney like bought Marvel, right? And it's like pumping out all these movies, but it's like, it's it's. I think that. Tabletop RPGs is such a community-driven thing, right? It's not mm -hmm. like a thing that you can consume. Uh, right. I mean, you can because people make content off of it, but generally, I think the the main way that people consume tabletop RPG stuff, uh, this channel included, actually, it's like you you guys play the games, right? Yeah. You get your friends going, and it's like if if it feels like you know a big corporation is trying to come at your table and you know tell you what to do or influence like your 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 hobby and it's just like yo dude like you're just making some rules for a game i can just go play another game <laughs> yeah like, that's why they want it to should... yep yeah no go ahead oh no i was gonna say like that's why they want it to be more of a lifestyle brand that's what we saw in that in those meeting notes 
uh, from that investor call at the end of December. Like, that's why they want to have more merch. That's why they want, like, the film. They announced a TV show uh, a few days ago. I don't have the exact date on that. Um, but they want to make it more of a lifestyle brand than just a game. I think the game's just going to be, like, a pillar of a content machine as opposed to the main focus of D&D. Yeah, and I'm not a big fan of that. I think that, I mean, I may just be burnt out on, you know, the multimedia empire of just Marvel, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, not including every other trying to get off the ground multimedia, uh, like, you know, IP out there. But it's like, sometimes I think that companies should just legitimately just make a good product i mean <laughs> and, like, they have the like, fan base for it they have yeah, the consumers like, they have if, the customers D- just make something they want to buy <laughs> if D just made a good game that worked and people could just buy it that would be nice <laughs> i mean like clearly it works for some people because it is like still the most popular tabletop rpg but you know, apparently what they're putting out isn't enough to monetize the audience that's there. So they have to monetize the third-party content creators somehow. Uh, yeah, I mean, nah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just I just feel, it just feels bad. Yeah. <laughs> Deep down in my soul. It hurts my soul. I'm still Maybe too curious about the movie, though. So I, just, I think I still want to see the movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, tell me if it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I probably will skip it because, uh, I don't know. I mean, like, what? I still don't think it'll give me anything that, like, a good fantasy movie wouldn't give me. <laughs> so, it's to me, it's like, oh, look, there's a black dragon. Oh, look, there's Vecna or shit like that, right? But, it's, yeah. I don't know. I would be more excited if Matt Mercer put out a movie than if Watsy put out a movie. That would be crazy. There. Actually, although I guess that's are, the critical role animated series, so yeah, they have the critical role animated series. I think that's way better because it's it's different. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like Watsi's IP is just kind of like the setting and the story and like the setting stuff and mm-hmm. probably some of the lore stuff. Like, it's not like it's not like a a a a truly like generated narrative that came out of a human being person, right? In a group of ta- in a group setting, it's like. When you're when you're watching the Critical Role animated series, you're like, oh my god, they did the thing that I experienced at the time, right? right. It's like it's like literally nostalgic because you were there, essentially, yeah. right? So it's like, I don't know, it's it's like, blah. I'm just blah. <laughs> well, blah. we'll see how we feel when the movie rolls around. It's gonna be a few months. I do kind of want to like leave this stuff alone for now. So unless something new comes up about the. OGL 2.0 or the orc I might just try to check out from this just because I was like obsessively checking stuff like pretty much all last week and I was very annoyed that stuff happened after we recorded an episode but obviously it would <laughs> so. yeah it's tough because we record these episodes in advance for the publishing date so yeah. it's like all that time stuff could happen uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't want to do that so I'm gonna I'm gonna be out from this for a bit and then we'll see what happens and if something yeah. important happens I'll talk about it Oh, maybe, Calvin, you should do shorts. <laughs> you should just maybe Ooh. make a little bit of shorts. That that would be cool. If you get, if you hear anything, um, maybe we'll just put it put it in the YouTube shorts. Uh, to, to see those shorts, I don't know if, if you subscribe, you get the shorts. I don't know how shorts work. Uh, but if you subscribe, <laughs> I mean, you should see, see them if you're subscribed. Um, although they get yeah. most of their numbers from the shorts feed. It's a whole thing that I'm experimenting with, and we'll see how yeah. it goes. But if you if you subscribe and hit that bell notification, which actually we never ask anyone to subscribe to our channel, so really appreciate everyone here that is subscribed and listening. Uh, thanks, you guys are the real G's. You know you know what's up. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, subscribe, hit the notification bell when Calvin posts shorts. I think uh, the Skyrim shorts are awesome. Uh, they're 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 really good. And uh, yeah, maybe yeah, we'll, Calvin will give you an update. I'm going to tell Calvin right now he needs to give you an update if anything happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's get into something that we actually care about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that's fun. <laughs> yes. The campaign run by friend of the show, Tim. Uh, the sequel to our Lost Mind of Delver campaign. 
uh, unintended consequences. Uh, when we last left this campaign, uh, the party consisting of uh, Teeks, a changeling druid, Silrona, a human wizard slash cowboy, uh, Falum, a human, uh, I believe he's a fighter, with the yep. fighter like shield master, and uh, Bren, a human ranger slash monk. We had helped rescue uh, Bren's younger sister from a bunch of cultists who had, you know, kidnapped her. And Teeks was worried about her family, so we went up to where her father lives, uh, just in time to see him be attacked by a guy who popped out of the cowboy dimension, which is a place yeah. that Silrona gets teleported to whenever Ramon can't make it to a game. Uh, yeah. And this guy yeah. was a hobgoblin, uh, Silrona's rival, known as Hi Hat Harry. Yes. Um... Yes, hi hat Harry. It's a hobgoblin with lots of hats. <laughs> <laughs> Literally a stack of hats. Yeah. So, uh, pretty much he showed up. He took a shot at Teeks' father. We were just barely able to keep him alive. We brought him to the nearest town uh, to get him settled with a healer there. Um, so he's alive for now, but there will probably be long-term consequences from that, like, from that shot. Um, that we still don't know yet because we had to leave pretty much right away. Yeah, yeah, we were yeah, cause um, yeah, we had to go after Hi Hat because if Hi Hat knew where we were and could just show up and shoot us, mm -hmm. uh, we should probably go deal with them. <laughs> exactly. So Silrona so used his connection to the Cowboy Dimension to teleport, um, and brought us all to a place called Buzzards Creek. Um, which allegedly existed in somewhere called New Mexico, near the town of Agua Fria. <laughs> what does that mean to us fantasy characters? Yeah, yeah, I thought it was, I don't know, it was funny that he just placed it in the U.S., <laughs> uh, you know, during, I think it was like, it was in the 1800s? Yeah. Was it? I don't know when Cowboys happened. I think it was like the late 1800s, early 1900s. I'm assuming that's when Cowboys happened. So Eight, yeah, yeah, 1800s. Yeah. So we were we were in the town of Buzzards Creek, um, outside of Agua Fria, and um, I'm sure some people might start to get the reference there. Uh, but we were near the sheriff's office. We were greeted by Sheriff Durham, as well as Deputy, who is Silrona's pet rat, and also the deputy of the town. <laughs> and the most competent lawman in the region. Yeah. Or yeah, apparently. <laughs> law <laughs> mouse, is... rather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's that was really funny. <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh, but Durham had to borrow Deputy for a bit because, again, Deputy is like a lawyer, so Deputy had to go read a murderer his rights. So we were exploring the town, trying to find a way to track down Hi-Hat Harry. Uh, we encountered a, another townsperson, a very mysterious character who didn't make his intentions clear. Um, we weren't sure what they were, but he did have a big iron on his hip. <laughs> <laughs> so he we went into a saloon, um, and of course, it being a saloon, a typical bar fight was almost about to start off, but uh, Kavo managed to, Kavo, our uh, half-orc barbarian, uh, managed to defuse things with a glare because he is very, very intimidating. Um, there were some performers on stage. They were interrupted by some ghost cowboys who started singing, which was very cute. Um, yeah. I don't know why the audience was mad at them because they were adorable. Yeah, yeah. Tim even like moved them around and made them dance. I like thought that was like awesome. <laughs> yeah. Just was, like, I know how hard it is. He probably had to like click so hard <laughs> to make these guys move and like do a little square dance. It was awesome. Just move, moving the tokens around the screen. We were all playing in Foundry, so um, yeah. Yeah, I thought these cute. guys were great, but there was a yeah. there was a fight and there was some wrestling within the saloon. Uh, but we managed to defuse that fairly quickly. Um, so then we continued to do some investigation. We asked that guy that we saw, that man in black, um, you know, what he was doing here, if he knew where Hi-Hat was. He said his name was Ranger Robbins, and he was looking for a man called Texas Red. <laughs> uh, no idea what's that, what that was about, so we left him on his own. Yeah, yeah. But we did see some suspicious people in the saloon. We tried conversing with them. Uh, Teeks tried a charm spell, but it was surprisingly ineffective, and a fight broke out. Uh, and in the course of that fight, Kavo ended up killing one of the brawlers. 
um, which al which also uh, led to a fire starting, which we had to put out fairly quickly. But we did get a chance to have a conversation with a member of Hi Hat's gang, and he pointed us in the direction of Old McGucket's Rundown Mine, which was a mine made by a single man who thought he could make a mine all on his own, and he basically managed to make a 15-foot hole before he died. Yeah, like while he was digging. And <laughs> yeah. He, he collapsed. Uh, yeah, Old McGucket. So, um, Sheriff, or, yeah, Sheriff Durham arrived... Um, he was not very happy that we killed someone. Uh, and of course, uh, this is, uh, Silrona's, like, area where he's, uh, Silrona is usually a bit more destructive, but for some reason in the cowboy dimension, he's a bit more professional. There's just more rules in the <laughs> cowboy dimension. <laughs> well, specifically, like, in the town, because, you know, he, he understands that, you know, these, these people are, like, pretty, uh, like... I don't know, the power level's a lot lower. <laughs> like, so everyone understands that, like, he doesn't belong here. And, like, the fact that, like, he's bringing his nonsense here is, like, bad for these town folk. He, and Saron is, like, a hero, right? He doesn't want to... He's not, like, a... You know, like... He's a, he's a little bit more loose because, like, uh, I guess fantasy monsters and nonsense and stuff like that just can take more punishment than regular townsfolk. So he tries to keep that shit on the down low uh, because he just wants to, uh, you know kind of protect the town a little bit he like he's he, it's his home right he's home away from home when he's not off adventuring in fantasy land uh when he has to get teleported back to this town he needs a place to stay <laughs> he doesn't want to wreck it right right yeah and there's just more rules and it's like much more peaceful uh i well i think specifically because like all of our adventures have been taken out in the wilderness and like it's like more sparsely populated than i would say like i don't know like new mexico is probably uh Actually, I don't know, but I'm just assuming well, because back you know, then. this place has, yeah, back then, right? So it's like you know, in Fantasyland, it's like there you could go days in the woods, and there's like horrible things in the woods, but you could go like days in the woods here, and it's like you're gonna fight a bear or something, but there's like dragons and and other wizards and like demons and crap like that just running around. So right. it's just like yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Um, but we did get directions. Um, Sheriff Durham showed up. He was not happy about any of this. Uh, Cavo ended up having to stay in jail for at least a day. Um, but as we were heading out, we did see, or at least rather the next morning, we saw uh, this, this ranger, uh, this man in black, and he was standing 40 feet away from Texas Red. Uh, and there was a quick a quick shootout, a quick draw by the man with the big iron on his hip. And Texas Red uh, presumably had not cleared leather for a bullet fairly ripped. <laughs> um, as this guy took a shot, uh, and it wasn't until afterwards that I, I found out that this was largely a reference to a song Big Iron by Marty Robbins, which is essentially the story that was happening in the background while we were doing our crap. <laughs> Which was cool. It was cool to to like kind of experience a little bit, like having something fun that we're like that we could just like literally just be next to, and it's like, oh, <laughs> this whole story is <laughs> playing out regardless of what we were if we were here or not. <laughs> it's nice yeah. to see. Yeah. Yeah, I you think know, it's little, an interesting little, idea. Yeah, I think it's like a. I, I think one of those like vignettes. It's like you know, just like a moment, or like it's just like an encounter where it's like you just get to see something, experience something, and then you know, but it's not like a combat or you're even involved. You just spicing the world you know what i mean flavoring that shit yeah like as, as much as it was a reference to a song it was also just like making the world feel more lived in i guess because stuff happens that doesn't directly involve us but we can see it going on yeah like the the singing ghosts <laughs> right <laughs> that kind of those are very fun um yeah and tim had also mentioned that you know music can be an inspiration uh when it comes to creating stuff like, it doesn't exclusively have to be, like, from books or movies or TV or anything like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even, like, a sick riff from, like, a guitar solo inspired me to, like, about Lancer stuff. But yeah, there you go, folks. Yeah, this is, this is your secret second tip, folks. You let music inspire you. <laughs> um, yeah, goodness knows I've done a, a lot of that with some stuff I've listened to. That's why I want to get back into Starfinder. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that was the end of that first session within the Cowboy Dimension, and then next we, uh, we headed off to a ranch east of town owned by Betsy, 
because we needed some horse to go down to old McGucket's mine. And there we met a big guy in armor by the name of Cass, uh, who Corey, who was playing Kava, uh, he was playing Cass for a time because Kava was in prison. Yeah, uh, killed the dude. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So Cass joined up with us uh, while some of the party was testing him out. Uh, the rest were looking at the horses that they had available, including a donkey by the name of Rickety. Uh, that apparently Falum had to practice horse riding with because Falum's a sailor. He's not a horse rider. Yeah, the, the, that was like the biggest joke was that uh, Falum was like, I don't understand this place. <laughs> <laughs> it's like way too dry. I don't get it. <laughs> Literally like a fish out of water. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, but like I, I also love that uh, like everybody else except for Falum well, I follow him too. Like everyone's getting into the spirit. Like we we had like our tokens, and like slowly, slowly through like just picking up items off of like you know cowboy people. Like you know Teague's put on a hat and like a pair of white boots, and like yeah. everybody just started getting more cowboy to like fit the aesthetic. I thought it was so awesome. <laughs> it's just that area, man. This is how it gets you. <laughs> yeah, man. Jeez. Um, yeah, Silrona offered to pay with gems, uh, for the horses, uh, and Teeks did a little bit of charming to assist with that. I sure hope, uh, I mean, <laughs> sure if we get all those horses back, even though some of them ran off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, I think it's cool too. It, it, I had like a, so we, uh, they don't take gold coins, uh, in New Mexico, so, <laughs> like, you gotta get dollar bills. <laughs> Right? right you gotta get dollars right uh usd dollars so it's like um usd dollars but uh so it was interesting because it, it reminded me about when i made uh the the, the, the pirate campaign the witch market where the witch market doesn't take coins either right? right they don't care about your gold coins they want to trade stuff and barter like what are they gonna do with gold coins they can't make that into a potion exactly uh, unless they're cursed <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Betsy says she wanted the horses back in one piece. Fallon was wondering if they'll bring him back in one piece. <laughs> but either way, we set off. Um, we did encounter a horse and cart that was coming in our direction, just transporting some people. Uh, Silrona recognized one of the people on there, uh, Casey Big Gun Mitchell. Yeah, good old Casey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the cart was in disrepair. So we stopped to help them out. Uh, I didn't prepare mending that day, unfortunately. Neither we... did I. That was like a mistake. <laughs> right? God damn it. I think I had heat metal. Or no, I didn't have heat metal that day. But yeah, that would have been a good one for all when like where all the people had guns. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we stopped to help them out. And then we got attacked by some bandits. Uh, so we were trying to fight the bandits off. They were taking shots at us with pistols. Like, what the hell are these boomstick things? Uh, Casey apparently had a massive shotgun that was basically like the size of a cannon. Um, and he landed a shot on a bandit and just like, like tore the dude in half. Yeah, tore the dude, tore the dude and the horse in half. <laughs> yeah. Just obliterated them with this giant cannonball shot from this thing. Actually, it was based, I don't know if we could find the tweet. Uh, if you find the tweet that Casey's based off of, that's also a pretty good one. Uh, I think it was just like a mod for Red Dead Redemption, and it's like uh, they just modded to have the shotgun to be like comedically big, <laughs> and uh, when you fired it, it just it just basically like like just firing like a, a artillery shell, and uh, yeah, it it was it was pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, uh, Casey, uh, you know, we, we fought a bunch of uh, uh, bandits and experienced gunfire for the first time. We were in a firefight. And uh, just kind of understanding the ranges of like being on horseback and like trying to fight dudes that are like hundreds of meters, hundreds of uh, feet away, right? It was like a, a big shock to, I think, all the melee bros. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, really kind of justifies. I know that retroactively, like, I'm like, oh yeah, magic missile is kind of like shooting a gun <laughs> if, if the bullets didn't miss. But now it's like, it, I think, uh, not by design, but like I guess it all the theming wise, it's like yeah, no wonder Sorona only shoots magic missiles. The ranges he has to deal with is wild. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why why bother trying to like get close? Just like 
kill them with magic missiles. <laughs> yeah, because they have pistols. They'll get you first. <laughs> yeah, they'll get you first. And uh, Sorona is a soft boy. Uh, <laughs> he is a wizard. He, he is a wizard, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there was some fighting back and forth. We saw Cass use some melee and some pistol action. There was some fireballing from Sorona, of course. Uh, Bren did some punching. Everybody was getting in on it. Uh, as Fallon was trying to help protect the civilians. Uh, but before he could get in place, um, the bandits took some shots at the caravan and they did end up killing one of the civilians, which Casey was very angry over. Because uh, yeah. Casey doesn't get how Solrona's magic works. Yeah, it was just kind of a. I think um, it, there was. A, I have like an. I had like an item back from when we beat up Glass Staff. Uh, it's like a, a staff of protection. I think it's like a D&D item, actually. Mm. Um, but uh, it's supposed to grant like plus one to your AC and like have like shield and stuff like that as the spells. But like Casey's like, you're a magic person. Can't you just like shield people with your magic? And it's like, oh no, man. Like I have like rules <laughs> to follow. <laughs> uh, which kind of also kind of uh, themed the world to be like how like this is like a low magic world. Yeah. And it's like people don't, people don't get how like wild is in the other place. <laughs> I come, where, where, I, where the fantasy line where I come from, right? or I mean, where Silverona comes from. I was just thinking this would be in, like that, like a low magic Western fantasy thing would be like a very cool campaign setting. Um, I just have cowboy centaur stuck in my head, but it, I don't know. It would be really, it would be a, this would be like a really fun setting. It would just have like a, a, spi a sprinkle of magical stuff in it. Yeah, yeah. I think like low magic settings are interesting because it makes. Uh, problem solving you know uh more interesting mm. <laughs> i mean pathfinder skews towards melee combat like better like if you just want to put something in the dirt you just have a fighter just have just walk up to it and then just hit it or like basically because of the way that pathfinder works is with the critical hit system it's like the fighters are fi the fighters main thing is they have a really high attack bonus so they're more likely to crit and if a fighter crits you it's like bad <laughs> it's right. like yeah. one billion damage <laughs> <laughs> right worse if they have a weapon uh that has like more like four times crit or not four times crit it's the uh what's it called uh when you when you get extra dice when you critical hit uh, uh fatal um, Fatal, yeah, it has fatal, and usually the fat what the fatal does is it increases the the damage dice that you do and adds an extra damage dice on top of that. So, like uh, Cavo, Cavo's name to fame is the fact that he's wielding a pickaxe, and he has a high attack bonus, and he's super strong. So when he actually hits you, it's like, oh, all of a sudden, <laughs> Cavo was doing maybe like I don't know, like a D8. It goes to like three D10s plus like 16, which is like. I don't know, probably more than that. He, like, rolls, like, 50 damage all the time, which is Yeah, because he has his rage damage as well. That's one whole Sorona, <laughs> basically. <laughs> right? Like, so, Bob's yeah, man. that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's, like, low magic settings would just be, like, everyone's a fighter, and everyone's just going to die really fast. And, uh, you know, yeah, that kind of deal. <laughs> um, but, yeah, in, in the chaos, uh, Rickety the donkey ended up fleeing off. Uh, we did take one of the bandit's horses, and then we found a spot to rest up for a bit as um, Casey continued on to the town. Um, and then Teeks and Bren had a conversation, because Bren found some stuff in Teeks' father's home. Uh, some dream catchers that Teeks made in her youth, as well as a map of the Sword Coast that pointed to an extra island that didn't exist on the other maps. Um, what could it be? I don't know. I actually don't know. <laughs> So, I mean, I have a couple guesses, um, which I may or may not have talked to Tim about. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's. I don't know if he used my idea. I was just spitballing with him in a conversation. So we'll see. I'm excited. I'm very like I have a guess, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, and then at night we were taking watch. You know, typical night stuff. And then a bear attack happened. <laughs> Yeah, but we were yeah. able to uh, protect ourselves from being destroyed by these bears and you know fend them off. Well, it was one bear and one really, really mean bear. Oh yeah, it so was. Kinda, it was just yeah, 
like a problem. He's trying to eat our horses. He's trying <laughs> to attack our horses and eat our horse. And um, so we have to defend the horses because we have to get the horses back to... Uh, uh, back to Betsy. Oh, back to Betsy, yeah. yeah. Uh, I realize I think the crux of our whole uh, quest is the fact that we got these horses from Betsy and we care to bring the horses back to Betsy. <laughs> I mean, the donkey is gone, so... <laughs> That's true. Uh, I mean, maybe we'll find uh, Rickety. Uh, maybe <laughs> one day we'll find Rickety. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, but yeah, then we came up to, and this is the third session. We continued heading in the direction of Old McGucket's Rundown Mine. Uh, we were riding in a badass line, of course. Uh, Silrona in the middle, uh, with Teeks and Cass on his right, and then Falm and Bren on his left. And then we were coming up on this canyon known as Lawless Ridge, which is sort of this 20 meter high ridge on like surrounding a valley. And we saw like a corpse and some discarded items within the area. It seemed like a pretty good place to set up an ambush. Uh, and we were ambushed as a member of Hi Hat's gang said that Solrona could go on ahead, but the rest had to stay and wait back. Um, so he does start riding ahead, but as he does, we are suddenly ambushed by a chemist throwing a bomb, um, people at the top taking shots, and then everything just kind of kicks off. And we have to struggle between like fighting off these guys who are up this 20 foot ridge, as well as you know trying to climb up there and get a good shot in on them. Uh, Cass took some serious damage after a fireball chain reaction. Yeah, yeah, Silrona's I mean, Fireball, again, I think I talked so much about how awesome Fireball is. Uh, specifically, Pathfinder. Like, that spell is, I think, uh, overtuned for that level a little bit, uh, just a little bit. Um, and it's extremely exacerbated with the fact that we're basically fighting in, like, an open plane. And it's, like, the, the distance is, like, really, really long. This is a really long. So I think the, the bad guys were at least, I think, 200 feet away. And Fireball has a range of like 500, right? Right. <laughs> so, and uh, it's like, so I basically just threw a Fireball downtown and uh, nuked a, uh, a chemist. one of the alchemists, a chemist, yeah. right? And then the chemist's re uh, reagents reacted and then caused like a secondary explosion, which was a little ad hoc uh, because we didn't really have rules for it. But, um, you know you just roll a bunch of d6s and that everyone seems happy with that yeah i mean it made perfect sense to me yeah, although i was trying very hard not to hit my friends uh <laughs> but you know you can't stop secondary explosions yeah yeah cast did get roughed up um i was trying to save my healing spells for the boss fight so i was like okay i need to like physically get up there and do some healing because i can do that way better than just a heal spell from a distance uh mm -hmm. Fallon was helping deal with some what essentially seemed at first like another cowboy wizard. Uh, he did manage to disarm the spellbook from that guy before he got taken out. Um, and it looked like he was just a regular cowboy that someone had taught um, somewhat functional spells to. Yeah, like he had a wizard spellbook given to him and he was uh, kind of competent at it. Exactly. He even managed to do some mirror images uh, before we took him down. Yeah. As well as this one cowboy guy with a metal arm that had like a pistol almost integrated into the arm. Yeah, he was pretty steampunky. Yeah. Um, but uh, so after that, actually, the the fight concluded with a retreat from the enemies because they were, I guess, there to stall us out or something. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they were there to stall us out. Yeah. Uh, re like retroactively thinking about the next section of this this uh, this session. Uh, yeah, so they're there to stall us out and uh, kind of waste our time. But um, the the bad guys retreated, and we kind of gathered. Uh, we we looted some uh, some of the stuff and and uh, kind of regrouped and thought about our game plan going in. I think we initially thought to just uh, to ride in there, uh, yeah. just so we can like make up the ground because the bad guys were like fleeing on foot. Uh, but then we decided to leave the horses because we were like, we're not going to bring the horses into like this seemingly like finale boss fight because, you know, they're just like horses. They only have like 20 HP or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if they get caught up in anything, it's, uh, it's over. It's over. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
So we did leave them behind. We we walked in a badass line towards McGucket's mine. Um, there was a little Stardust Crusaders like just. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, well, as all the Stardust comes together, uh, we walk towards this mine. Uh, there wasn't any sign of Hi-Hat Harry at first, but we did see the bandits taking up cover near the mine. Um, so pretty much everybody in the party was moving to cover, except Solrona, who was firing magic missiles. Uh, and we were trying to make our way up there, uh, bouncing between the covers that we had available. And then Hi-Hat Harry arrived with a like loud steam whistle noise and a bill of steam following him. I think he was in a steampunk world, to be honest considering what he is yeah. capable of. Uh, yeah. But when he showed up, he had Deputy with him uh, in, in little in little mouse handcuffs. Uh, apparently, I had Harry had to shoot the sheriff, but did not shoot Deputy. Once again, <laughs> once again inspired by music. <laughs> Sounds like cowboy songs. <laughs> <laughs> is that <what> <laughs> I oh, guess yeah, close enough. <laughs> so yeah, um, I mean that ruined some of my plans because I had a certain spell that I wanted to use, but it was an area spell, and I didn't want to hit yeah. deputy. It also ruined my plans because, well, to be fair, I don't think I could have cast another fireball. I would have to like, uh, but like any of my area effect stuff, I had to be more careful. And it was, I think it was very dramatic that deputy showed up. I was oh like, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> I was like super stoked, even though I was like, oh no, but I was like, oh yes, like my GM brain is like, oh nice, I would also do that. <laughs> That's sick, man. <laughs> yeah. Because the bad guys want to win, right? I'm like, I'm down for it, let's go, like, raise the stakes. Yeah, I mean, they know you fireball, so let's put something important here. <laughs> yeah, although I used to fall my fireballs on the big group. I mean, anytime there's like a cluster of dudes, and I'm like, finally! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I should have prepared. Uh, yeah. I should have prepared my own fireball. I had lightning because I didn't want to like mess with melee guys, and I figured lightning would work better to hit enemies, but not our melee guys. But yeah, yeah lightning's lightning's tough. Lightning's like having a line is very hard to get. Like unless you're fighting in a dungeon where it's like you know one t like a hallway, it's very hard to get people to stand in a line. <laughs> yeah, like that's why like I wasn't worried about hitting multiple people because my focus like every spell I prepared was just like, I gotta beat the boss. Like I had, um, well actually I don't know if it'll come up, so I don't know if I should say, but like I, I had lightning like specifically to hit ha Hi-Hat Harry without hitting melee guys. I had mm -hmm. like tether to help keep him from getting away. Um, I had, uh, there was, there's was a water version of flaming orb, um, but it can grab people. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. I mean, again, it's like, it's tough because, well, let's get it. So like, yeah, so hi, so hi hat showed up, right? And um, so there was about, we were like, I think a three turns into the map, I think. About I think it was that. on the third turn he showed up. And uh, there were still like, we were not anywhere near getting up into melee range with those dudes. So uh, our frontline fighters were still kind of uh, using the cover to get up there. And then Solrona, because I don't know why, I think I was just too much into the sauce for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I, I did not get cover. I did not choose to stand in cover. I chose to stand my ground. Like, and I was like, this is it. <laughs> this is the, the, the showdown I was, I was waiting for, right? So I I pulled up and I just kind of stood out in the open and just started firing off magic missiles and spells and stuff like that all over the place. Um, because I just assumed based on the math, uh, I, a little, it's a little bit of metagamey, but based on the roles that, that Tim was doing, I was like, I can get hit a couple of times and be fine, right? Hmm. I don't need to get cover because these dudes are far enough away that their weapons are getting negatives. And that was saving me, right? I was like, okay, I can just stand mm. back here, like at at the very edge of my extremely long range with my spells, and just kind of work my way up as soon as like you know, I, and like let them have the negative because you know Serona has 
like this is just kind of like Silrona has like the has dealt with people shooting at him before, so he's like, I'll just stay really far back. They're more likely to miss, and then I can use my spells, right? That makes sense. But uh, the problem was when Hi Hat showed up. Uh, Hi Hat has a really remember we talked about throughout this whole uh, episode about how. Uh, in Pathfinder, if you have a really high attack bonus, uh, you know, the game just... You're playing a different game than everybody else. Like, it doesn't <laughs> actually matter what we do. Uh, you're going to kill us. <laughs> yeah, if you go so, fishing for crits, yeah. Yeah, you go fishing for crits in Pathfinder, you win. I think all crit builds in Pathfinder are a little tuned up, which, I mean, I'm down for it. Uh, but, yeah, I wasn't expecting High Hat's uh, attack bonus to be that high. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I he he pulled out uh, Sinner and what was the other one? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> other Phantom, guy. I think it was. Yeah, it was Phantom. He shot me with Phantom first, and we we're like, "What is this madness?" <laughs> I think Tim rolled like a thirty-seven. And I was like, "Everybody, everybody's gonna die!" Like immediately, yeah. I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> right? Like, like <laughs> he was like, "This dude is not fucking around." No. And uh, Phantom, I think he rolled and it was like, okay, he did like 16 damage. And then Tim's like, wait a minute. We forgot about the, uh, what's it called when you, Fatal, the Fatal mm -hmm. D10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're like, oh no, that immediately, as soon as I saw Fatal D10 and that high ass attack, I mean, he <laughs> rolled like a 17, right? So it's like, yeah, or like maybe a little bit higher, but it's like, it was, I was like, we're, we're going to die. Like Tim, Tim's got to shoot somebody else. Uh, other than me or i'm gonna die straight up like and he did like half my half my hp in like one shot yeah and and to be fair like he was rolling really well for hi-hat i think most of hi-hat's rolls were double digits at least yeah but the problem was that hi-hat had a second gun <laughs> also that <laughs> <laughs> which it... was sinner which is basically the same thing <laughs> i think it's a little bit of difference but it was still fatal d10 which yeah. is the the problem and it was like Oh, and then Hi Hat obviously being a dual wielding person, he's pretty good at shooting both his guns in the round, right? Uh, yeah. Because Pathfinder has like a degrading attacks uh, attack system where like your um, your uh, you get penalized for down. like yeah. yeah multiple attacks in a turn. Multiple attack. Yeah. So then it's like, oh yeah, and then you know that became an issue real fast. <laughs> yep. Uh, but you know, I had I had I had hopes that. I, like Sorona was probably gonna go down, and I think that was fine because I personally made the decision to stand out in the open, and I was okay with that. Yeah. Uh, I planned for this. I took Die Hard, and I was like, "All right, cool. Like, I can, I can survive. I can probably survive a couple of rolls of the on the death chart and be okay, right?" <laughs> probably he says. Uh, then he gets I mean, taken down by a crit. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> it wasn't my fault. I mean, it was my fault, but I think either way, if I was in cover, I would have gotten critted. So, it, 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 like, Hayat's attack, attack was so high and my defenses were so low that there was nothing Tim could do to, not, to save me. Like, it was by math, by raw, like, I was like, like no matter any way, I would have to leave the combat. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's how that's how wild this was. the only way to win is to not play <laughs> it's to not play right i should have just logged off <laughs> um yeah it got pretty rough i mean like uh being a healer is stressful especially as a class not built specifically to be a healer because yeah, then i, I couldn't not do one of your job no <laughs> like, i couldn't no. do my stuff i had to change direction and i couldn't go into cover because you were so far out so I had to move pretty slowly because I had to save an action to raise my shield um, using yeah. the Pathfinder mechanics to get to you, to heal you. And then by the time I did, uh, I had to worry about Cass and Phalum because they were both down as well. Yeah, which I think was possible. Again, like we're playing as a group. I, I think after the couple of hours to sit with it, I was like, what were we doing? We should have just ran ahead. <laughs> like using the cover was fine, but the way that Tim placed the cover was super detrimental to us like not that he intended to but like after i like thought about the math i was like we should have just went in a straight diagonal like we should have all just rushed because even if even if they all shot at us and hi-hat shot at us uh and all that damage within two turns we would have been in melee combat versus three and a half turns in melee combat which is where everybody else gets to shine right and then being super been, spread out yeah it would have been 
two turns for me and Teagues to get into optimal spell range. Uh, well, it's two turns for Teagues to get into optimal spell range, one turn for me to get into optimal spell range, and two turns, I think, to get the melee characters up in there, or at least close enough to where they can start, like, they can they can actually just get get in and, and, and deal with the gunfire a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And there I was, was like... Oh, sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I was okay. going to say, there was definitely some stuff that I know I personally could have done that I feel like Teeks is just going to be bothered by because I did kind of hesitate on one of my turns. I should have just gone right for you instead of trying to stay in cover and then, you know, raise the shield and everything. And I also, I prepared to text magic because I thought I would have to use it to figure out which hat he was using to teleport because I had to spell magic as well. I was I was prepared for high hat specifically. I wasn't prepared for him to show up with deputy. But I was going to yeah. detect magic on his hat and see if I could figure out which one was at least the most powerful one and then try to dispel magic on it. So I didn't have yeah. a spell slot I needed for Ray of Frost, which would have had enough range to at least start doing some damage from far back. You know what? It's true. And uh, we didn't know what Hi-Hat's abilities were going to be. Like, I assume Hi-Hat was a wizard, but no, he was just like a really good shooting dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? With magical hats. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I was here to, I was, I was ready for a wizard duel, but this dude was like, nah, man, I play for keeps. <laughs> <I'm> like, oh, <laughs> I didn't come here to party. I came here to fight. <laughs> yeah, I, like I legitimately thought that hi hat was, hi hat's a, I thought hi hat's main ability was like maybe his hats do something cool. Right, like maybe each hat has a cool ability, and like one of them is the cowboy hat. Right, mm. not that like every hat is actually like a dimensional hat <laughs> that you can go to. <laughs> you can go to, which means hi hat has the ability to travel ten different dimensions. Uh, one of them being cowboy, the other one being uh, that we know of is being uh, the fantasy land, the Sword Coast. And the other one being uh, apparently some water place. <laughs> yeah, because after he had uh, taken down, after Cass and Fallon went down, uh, Hi-Hat said um, that he was supposed to keep some of you alive for him without saying who that him is. Um, <laughs> but then, but then, Kavo comes riding in, yell- letting out a battle cry as he rides in on horseback, wearing these broken manacles from the prison. Coming in to rescue Teputy after he got kidnapped from the jail. Um, he did manage to take Hi Hat's attention, and um, while that was happening, unfortunately, Phalum crit failed a death save, uh, causing him to die because he had, gone, he had been taken down by a crit. Much like Drake before him, and much like Throsiak in the Crown of Dragons campaign, got taken down by a crit, and then crit failed the death save. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but them's the breaks, man. <laughs> them's is the breaks. <laughs> um, and at that point, Hi Hat was uh, so, so like how Silrona suddenly disappears into the cowboy dimension. Hi Hat was suddenly surrounded by a pool of water at his feet, uh, and then like how he did before, where he grabbed the um, like when Silrona gets teleported away, he leaves a horseshoe behind, and the same thing almost happened to Hi Hat, but he was able to grab the horseshoe before. This time, as he's being teleported away, he grabbed an eye patch out of the air before disappearing with like a splash of water, which was quickly, you know, absorbed and into the sand. Mm-hmm. But uh, so he's gone to some sort of, I assume, pirate dimension with the eye patch in the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it seems as though Phalum has fallen in battle. We were able to, you know, deal with the last of the bandits, and we've got some stuff from them, you know black powder, pistols, things like that. But it seems as though Phalum has now fallen in battle. Which is uh, very sad, because Teeks was really starting to like Phalum. Like someone else who was connected to the water. Not not exactly the same as she was, but, you know. Relatable, right? Yeah. It was, yeah, you guys had, like, that connection. And I think that it's a, it's sad, too, because Phalum and Bren... They're like, bros. They're two characters. They're bros. They're like, yeah, they're like the... They're like the bro squad, and um, you know, uh, I think that as far as inter-party dynamics, it sucks. <laughs> I was like, oh no, Phalum. Which I mean, uh, Phalum's uh, a player quack was like, yeah, I, I, that's how it happens, right? It's fine. Like, you know, I, I think I don't know how much uh, tabletop RPGs or games he's his quack has played, but I mean, quack is like quack's like, okay, that's okay. I'll just make another character. But everybody, you know, a lot of everybody else is like, ah, damn it. <laughs> You know, 
which is fair. And I think that uh, I call like I definitely called the TPK like before. I was like I was like, listen, uh, we're all gonna die. Everyone should run away immediately. <laughs> Uh, cause, uh, I think Silrona was down and, uh, then Cass went down and then Fallon went down or they basically happened at the same time. And yeah. then we were left with Teeks. two party members. Yeah. yeah Teeks was still up. Yeah. Um, but was like Bren. pretty low as far as health goes. Bren was still up. Um, but still had some distance from hi hat at least. Uh, yeah, Kava was in play with... and that could have tilted yeah. things, but. I, th I think even if Kavo was in play, if Hi Hat had taken his turn and just shot Kavo, Ka he could have probably easily done like like Hi Hat did uh, seventy damage to me in like three attacks, right? And I don't Kavo's AC is high, but not thirty seven high to not get crit. So um, I mean, I think Kavo has like one hundred and twenty HP. I mean, maybe a couple of things, and even if Kavo got up to him and landed a crit. He, like I had obviously had more than 50 HP, yeah. which is like probably around the max that Kavo can do with a crit if he happened to crit, but probably not because AC is also in like linked to the the character level. So there's like a 20% chance of like well, less chance of Kavo hitting compared to like you know a regular enemy. So it's like yeah, it's all sorts of numbers stuff. <laughs> I, like, part of me still thinks that we had a slim chance. I think if Fallon didn't die and I was able to get everyone back up uh, with, like, heal bursts, uh, which I wish Reach spell worked on the heal burst, but it doesn't, so. But oh, if, I, if I could have turned that around, I wanted to use my Aqueous Orb. <laughs> uh, I spent so much time specifically, like, okay, I'm going to trap him in the orb. I'm gonna tether him so he can't get away. I'm gonna use the orb to keep him grabbed, and then I'll use the tether to keep him immobile, and then I'll dispel the magic on the hat, and then people were dying, and I had to go heal. <laughs> yeah, and and also I think that without Cavo, not that I don't know, I really had no background on what Cass's deal was, but Cass didn't. I think Cass throughout this whole thing didn't do anything. It was just the uh, rolls, to be fair. Yeah, uh, to be fair, yeah. I mean, but still, it's like the fact that Cass or Corey's the player was like having, uh, I guess, bad like a string of bad luck. This like every like you know a uh, couple of sessions made us basically just play with one less character because <laughs> like he didn't impact the battle like at all. So then it was like ah, you know, I kind of miss Cavo because Cavo was reliable, you know. And uh, Solrona was also kind of like the damage, reliable damage person. Because I think if I had gotten off one more max level uh, triple magic missile, level three magic missile, I think I would have been able to kind of clean up some of the bad guys. And then it would have just been like a basically high hat versus the rest of the party, which I think would have been fair at that point. Yeah. You know, it would have been like a race to if if Hi Hat could crit us all to death versus if we could get up into his face. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think on it like if it was if it was just Hi Hat if we could have handled that, but I maybe I think there's too much variation, but I think maybe. I think Hi Hat could have taken out at least two of us. If it was just yeah. Hi Hat, he could have definitely taken out. If he targeted me and you, like like uh, Solrona and Teagues, like he can definitely kill us. In the oh no, yeah, no, we wouldn't have come out of that with everyone alive. <laughs> Yeah, like, we would have been <laughs> bleeding out immediately. <laughs> but all the swole boys, like, they could definitely take, like, at least three shots. And he could only fire two guns at the, in one turn. So, by raw. <laughs> you know, but he, 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 he could reload the them, even with a hand yeah. occupied, so. I yeah, forget what he, he only, did. Yeah. But he only has, he can, he can use two, he only has three actions per turn. So he can, every turn, fire two guns, which means... Every turn, he can just select somebody and probably crit us to death, you know. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. It, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's like it's like ah, uh, yeah. I and think like, it was again, possible, but yeah. I, 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 that that might just be me uh, coping. As <laughs> so. <laughs> all of us huffing the copium, man. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's 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 where we kind of left off. Uh, I think you had to, to leave suddenly. Oh, not suddenly, but like yeah, I I to had leave to earlier. leave at five, and I'm, so of five. course I left at like five twenty. But uh, yeah, TPKs. Uh, I mean, I think that's appropriate. 
uh maybe maybe we could do like a little bit of a an episode just like our like portion of an episode on like boss encounters because this is like a good example of like uh <laughs> boss encounters not boss encounters go wrong but like boss encounters like what could possibly happen mm. to kill your parties during a climactic ending boss fights yeah uh, because you want to make it hard but also you love the characters but you just want to hurt them a little bit <laughs> <laughs> right. I've definitely been in positions where I'm like, did I make this too hard? Uh, although it doesn't yeah. usually come until after a character dies. Uh, yeah, right, right. You're like, no, they'll be fine. They'll be fine, crit. Uh, oh, uh, oh no. <laughs> whoops. I've definitely been in a position where I put, like, I did put, like, an adult dragon in front of the uh, Crown of Dragon party. Um, but that was in a space where, like, they could use, like, a time manipulation thing to make it younger. So it was more level appropriate. Yeah, um, it was like up to them to choose, right? Yeah, and then there was that one that one shot where they had to fight that that machine that was just uh, drilling into people. Uh, <laughs> that's what that's the problem, man. Once you give somebody a drill, it's like they just like channel grown Laga and energy, <laughs> and it's like <laughs> you're like they're literally unstoppable. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> Look, well, guys, will, just fight the power. What are you drill, doing? <laughs> Yeah, no, their 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 drill will pierce the heavens. Like, don't do not do not give a, an NPC a drill. It's they're gonna they're gonna get wrecked. Uh, yeah, I think I think every now and then some something happens and a combat's a bit too strong. But you know, I'll say first one's the hardest. The first player death is the hardest. <laughs> and then you just get used to it, right? <laughs> I still remember Keeley. Uh, I still remember that bit of bad luck. But, uh... Yeah. I, was Keeley like, the first? Honestly, no, Keeley wasn't the first. Ke Throziak was the first. That, yeah, yeah, I think Keeley was the second. No, yeah. Keeley was like, third, because then Maywin was second. Oh, okay. <laughs> Trying to run through the list. I feel like I should remember it better. You should just have, like, a... You should just, in your Google Docs or OneNote or whatever, just put, like... Like the the death board, <laughs> like the memorial of all the player characters you've killed. You've one side is the blur. player characters that are dead, and one side is the ones that are alive. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be the best, actually. Uh, <laughs> you should put that on the website. I think that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Like if you want to see all the characters we've killed in our campaigns, uh, just cut the list. You can, you can, it's like, a, a little, um, I forget what it's called when somebody dies and they write in the, the paper. I think it's like obituary. obituary yeah. you, just have a, you just put obituaries of like, you know, these people's stories. And it's like, died here. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So yeah, we, were, we lost Falum, uh, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm sad. Teeks is sad. Um, I think Quack's okay with it, but I don't. I don't know what else. <laughs> yeah, Quack's is like, oh shit. I guess I'll just pick another character. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I will. The wall, will man. Say, <laughs> the wall. <laughs> the wall. I know. I know. We had. We had like the wall, and we had. It felt really good, but I think the problem we also run into is that. Uh, and again, it's not Tim's fault. It's kind of like the way that the game is designed is that like you're you're when you level up, it's like it ex it expects you to also level up your gear simultaneously. Mm. So like I, I don't know what everybody else has, but I don't think like I, I know that like I don't think my gear is is, is kind of like at the level I think we should be at. Um, I definitely think I think Cass was low, pretty low damage on his pistol when he did hit, so that I might have been needed to be scaled up a bit too. But yeah, possibly. I mean, it's hard yeah, for like, me to I, gauge because I just do spells, so those go up when I level up. So yeah, but it feels like if it's not Cable hitting somebody, it was like we're not doing. I feel like we're not doing enough damage. Mm. Um, because like I don't know, my brain thinks about like the DPS or the or the the dot that damage DPT damage per turn like. And like how fast enemies can go down like that's how i envision like enemies health bars and stuff and i think the players is like how fast can these players if everything is average defeat this dude if it's like if this enemy is one to is this enemy a one to two turn enemy or is this like a three to four turn enemy right kind of deal right and like that's how i kind of see it and uh because you know the longer a bad guy stays on the field the more damage it's gonna do 
So it's like you can gauge it that way. And also, I think this kind of showed the detriment, I think, for online tabletop uh, systems, right? Or uh, programs, because Tim couldn't just lie, <laughs> right? Tim couldn't just quickly change the number, like, you know, oh, I'll just, instead of doing this, I'll do that. He had to, like, go into the system and do this, or, like, you know, he couldn't just flub his roles, right? Yeah. And then and adjust on the fly because everything has to be set in stone beforehand and you have to follow the rules 100%, which again is like not my style uh, anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can hide your roles, but people still know you rolled something. So Exactly, right? And it's and it's like I think the that that's kind of one of the detriments. It's like you can't if you if you cuz like you're doing you, every time you make a new encounter, you're you're test running that for the first time ever. And it's like it's very, very difficult to get something right the first time. That is true. Right. Yeah. It comes with experience and it gets better as the more that you do, but like fuck, it's tough, man. Even I'm like, ugh, <laughs> I probably made this too hard. Or maybe just half its HP so then you know the players can kill it faster. <laughs> just do what I do and get used to it. I, I had to <laughs> I had to look up the notes from that one shot I ran. Um, so, so far, I've killed Throsiak Marble Buster, I've killed Maywin, I've killed Keeley, I've ki killed Kerr Zinsharu, uh, Valpip Bureau Trend, and Thistle. And that's it. I've killed, uh, uh I'm pretty sure this is Drake. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> well, I deserve it. <laughs> Just Drake. Um, which... I think it's fun. Character deaths are awesome when they, I mean, they happen suddenly, but I think you just got to roll with it. Uh, yeah. You know, and even and if a party totally dies, I think that you can still recover from it and continue the campaign. You just have to attack it from a different angle with a different group of people, because if you're bad, like realistically, uh, if your bad guys are the baddest of guys, uh, your party shouldn't be the only people trying to stop them. Like there's a whole wide world, and it's not just up to the players to, to like. It's obviously you want the story is about them and their trials and tribulations, but they like there should be more than the players just trying to get rid of the evil dragon because that evil dragon controls like you know kilometers of territory. There's more than just the players trying to deal with it. It's probably other adventurers or other organizations or whatever your bad guy is trying to like stop them because you know bad guys don't just be bad to the players; they'd be bad to everybody. Exactly. Yeah. That makes sense. That's fair. Um, I feel like player death could be like character death could be like a whole thing on its own. Um, yeah. Because as much as I pretend to blow it off, it does bother me that I like did I not do this correctly. And it sucks. It sucks as a GM. I think that like the the mental load of like oh no I, I like fucked up all of my plans all of my stories my my, my player character you know like because it's like there's so much emotion and stuff tied up into that character and it's the fact that like again it's one of those things where it's like you know you spend so much time with this person and it's like ah fuck yeah <laughs> i don't want to upset my players or i don't want to ruin my story or yeah. whatever but it's like it's got to roll it's part of, it's part of life it's a part of it's part of D, &D man it's part of the game or i guess it's part of the game um, but yeah, that's where we're at right now, and I don't know where we're gonna go next. If we're gonna chase, if we're gonna chase Hi Hat into whatever pirate dimension he's gone into, if we're gonna get new gear, if we're gonna go back to our fantasy world. Um, I straight up don't know what's gonna happen next, but I guess we'll find out next time. Yeah, for sure. This is a long one, but uh... <laughs> yeah, because we tried to fit two big topics into one episode. Yeah, thanks for sticking it out uh, if you're at the end of the uh, episode. And uh, yeah, appreciate you guys. Yeah. Um, so let's just roll into the outro for now. And uh, I'll say if you've got some other game stories you want to talk about, just drop them in the comment below because we do like hearing stories about other people's campaigns. Uh, as well, since you're scrolling down there, be sure to check out our social media stuff as well as links to all the cool Lancer RPG people we've talked to and links to all the stuff that they're working on. Um, and again, with regards to the OGL discussion, I'll have links to sources and everything below for you to check out. Um, additionally, we're doing live, there's gaming, there, ah, we're doing, um, shorts on the channel. Um, a lot of them are going to be like the gaming stream ones for now. Um, but also please check out the gaming streams on Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. Um, and if you like the shorts, just, you know, click that like button and let the YouTube algorithm know 
because it's very fickle about whether something gets hundreds of views or dozens of views. Um, and I think that's all I got for now. Uh, Ramon, anything else you want to say before we head off? Dallas, get out of here, partner. <laughs> well, for all our cowboy GMs and players out there, just remember to keep on rolling with dice. Or winning with dice. Or... Gosh, I just lost the plot there because I was doing the accent. Uh, let's go. Bye. Bye. <laughs>